And this is, this is something that's exciting because it's a new opportunity uh, for uh, the industry, it's a new opportunity for uh, the service, it's a new opportunity uh, for our nation here. And so I talked to you uh, about the 3M. And the lens that we look at offshore industry uh, through and, and offshore wind development is through the lens of maritime safety. Uh, that's the first lens, through the lens of the mariner, and then also uh, through the lens of Coast Guard missions. And so let me explain what that means. And so when it comes to maritime safety, this is about ensuring, um, you know, this is a change that's happening uh, in the maritime domain. And we need to make sure that this change happens uh, safely. Uh, that this change happens and we can still uh, have traditional uses uh, of the waterways and things can still happen safely. And so the focus there uh, at my level here in uh, the first Coast Guard District has been on gathering the information on uh, traditional shipping routes, traditional shipping uses, and feeding that up uh, into uh, Coast Guard headquarters for the, public, for the publication of navigation fairways and uh, safe access routes and safe transportation routes. And then using that information to uh, make sure that uh, when the leases are being sold, uh, that uh, navigation safety is something that is uh, a part of that decision-making process for uh, Department of Energy Bureau of Ocean Energy, or Bureau of Energy uh, Management. Uh, so uh, that's you know part of that overall uh, maritime safety lens. When we think about the mariners, uh, we think about uh, you know the new opportunities uh, for these folks, uh, the ships that uh, they're working on, uh, the rules that uh, have been uh, applied for those ships. You know we, we see a lot of tonnage uh, moving up uh, from the Gulf Coast uh, to work in uh, New England. And over the course of the years, uh, we've gotten really comfortable with uh, how that industry works uh, down in the Gulf of Mexico, warm waters, a lot of density of traffic and vessels and everything else that's out there. And so uh, we need to make sure that as uh, these, uh, these ships uh, relocate to this area and engage in this operation, that we have that same understanding of uh, mariner safety on board those vessels that we're making sure that for those cold waters for maybe some more remote operations that we've got the right level of uh, standards and care uh, for the folks that are out there uh, working. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that goes into it that I know my colleagues will uh, talk about in terms of training and certification and, and opportunities uh, and, and we can do it. Then the last thing is Coast Guard missions. At the end of the day, uh, you know, when uh, something does happen out in the wind fields, uh, that uh, and folks, uh, you know, uh, jump into uh, life rafts or push the uh, alarm button or make a call, uh, and they expect to be uh, rescued by the Coast Guard. We need to make sure that we can continue to carry out our, our missions. And so we're spending a lot of time uh, with our crews uh, on, the uh, on the surface of the water and our crews in the air, uh, making sure that we understand how it's different to fly a helicopter into a uh, active wind field. What are some of the mitigations that we need before we go out there? What's some of the technology that's going to change how we can uh, carry out our work? What does it mean for folks that are operating on the surface? You know, what does that picture look like? What is their uh, capability ability to uh, handle that? So those are the three lenses that uh, we're looking at offshore wind, the work that's happening at the national level, at the regional level, at the local level. And a lot of that work is happening right here in, in the world as the courts are being moved out. Let me talk quickly about national security, and then I'll, I'll kick it back to uh, Sal. National security is woven into all aspects, right? So when we look at the uh, maritime safety piece of it and, and the why behind offshore wind, I mean, this is a unique opportunity to uh, uh, build more resilient energy infrastructure for uh, the New England region in particular. You know, I think everybody understands we're an island up here in New England, uh, particularly when it comes to energy. The pipeline stops in New Jersey. Uh, the only uh, petroleum that gets up into New England is really through barge and ship traffic uh, that comes up uh, from the coast. Uh, gas uh, that comes into New England really just comes in uh, from the broader international market and into uh, Boston and Massachusetts and has limited distribution. And so this is an opportunity from an energy security side, from a national security side, to be, have a more resilient uh, energy infrastructure. From the Mariner's perspective, uh, you know, we've heard it all throughout the morning. This is about new opportunities. We want to make sure that those new opportunities, uh, that those U.S. Mariners, I think, that can uh, 
build those needs that can, that have that training and expertise that they need, and that's going to serve the nation well uh, for uh, our national security as well. And then from the Coast Guard missions, uh, at the end of the day, this is also key critical infrastructure, uh, just like the facilities on land uh, that uh, need to be protected. We use a layered approach to uh, critical infrastructure security. Uh, heavily reliant on uh, industry to develop plans, to uh, implement plans, to action those things, to ensure their own security, but then using uh, my Coast Guard forces as well to uh, both oversee that and augment that at times. And so this a lot of right topics for uh, further discussion and look forward to uh, getting in, into it uh, during the time. Thanks so much. Thank you, Adam. Uh, next, uh, Captain Christian Spain, Vice President for Government Relations at American Maritime Officers. Uh, Captain Spain is a 1994 graduate of the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. You've never been to the Merchant Marine Academy. It is ideally located across from the finest maritime institution. <laughs> uh, after graduation, he worked in the U.S. maritime industry, advancing to master in 1999. Captain Spain sailed aboard merchant ships for two decades on 20 different vessels. 10 years of which were his master on three different classes of vessels. Additionally, Captain Spain spent several years working for Maersk Lines Limited and AP Moeller, managing a fleet of U.S. flag vessels and as a capacity planner for Maersk Lines. Captain Spain. Thank you very much, everyone, this afternoon. Yes, going after lunch is always hard. I'm going to uh, uh, <clears throat> take something that uh, Commissioner Betzel mentioned in his uh, story about Senator Inouye. Uh, I'm going <clears> to <throat> Take my prepared remarks and throw them out. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Evan Wilder, for repeatedly bringing up the fact that uh, that these are new opportunities, and that that's why I'm throwing it, throwing out the prepared remarks. And I just want to make I want to make uh, clear that um, in our industry, particularly in the United States, often people think that uh, that we're stuck, meaning we're not willing to move and do uh, do new things. But we do new things all the time, and I'll just give three quick examples. Um, when the STCW was changed more than 20 years ago, it basically me means that on the license side for unlimited oceans licenses, which are large offshore ships, there's, there's almost no way to move up anymore uh, as a hawse piper. And put that in perspective, in 1994, when I started with AMO, it was a hawse piper union. It was roughly 70 to 65 percent pause pipers. Um, that meant that most of the ships were roughly equal crew between academy and pause pipers. And over time, that was those were the best ships I was on. I was also on ships where I was the only academy grad, and I was on a couple other where there was just one pause piper. But we really lost something there. And as a result of that, um, we at AMO, we basically started producing our own engineers. And we bring in kids that are 18, and in two years, we make engineers out of them at no cost to them. That's how important we feel it is. Now, we don't produce a lot of them because we haven't up to this point needed to, but we're going to start doubling those numbers here soon. Another example, uh, when we had to build out rec most recently the domestic tanker fleet, um, recapitalization of the domestic tanker fleet, AMO is the union that provides most of the officers to the Jones Act and and to the few uh, uh, tankers we had sailing overseas. Um, we saw that we needed more PICs for the deck officers, and we have, we're one of two institutions in the world that provide, can uh, create um, uh, PICs, or persons in charge, for uh, <coughs> dangerous liquids. We can do that in 30 days. Most places it take, takes 90. And lastly, uh, we needed a bunch of ETOs um, for the Military Sealer Command. I think it was probably about four or five years ago. We worked with the Coast Guard. We, cre we created our own ETO program. We bring these things up only because, just to say that, yeah, we don't have any wind farms right now, but as long as everybody puts their thinking cap, it doesn't matter if it's AMO or an non union company or whoever, we're Americans, we can do it. It's not that difficult. Um, lastly, on the regulatory part, um, I didn't really think this transition out very well. <laughs> <laughs> On the regulatory part, I just said very briefly. Um, so, for those of you who don't, most of you in here know this, but 
I'm sure that the uh, students in here don't, and there might be a few that don't. Uh, but the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, that, that's the act that um, right now there's a, there's a, uh, it allows for vessels that are more than 50% foreign owned to operate in the U.S. waters with foreign crews. And that, that would apply to, uh, to wind farms. <clears throat> but the reason that that act was enacted was, quote, to reconcile dual concerns of providing fullest possibility of employment of Americans <clears throat> in activities and eliminating to the full extent retaliation by foreign nations against American workers and foreign offshore activities. Now, we do have foreign, we do have Americans at work in foreign offshore activities, but we don't have a whole lot. So if that was the reasoning behind um, allowing that exemption, uh, that's silly nowadays. And I'm sure that it'll be discussed here because on the regulatory side, but th this is really concerning the American Offshore Worker Fairness Act, which is uh, likely to at least try to be attached to the, the uh, National Defense Authorization Bill later this year. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Christian. Uh, next, uh, Captain E.J. Moreau, uh, Marine Affairs Manager for Equinor. Uh, Equinor is an offshore wind permitting team. Uh, he is a former U.S. Coast Guard captain with 27 years of experience. Over the course of 11 at sea and shore assignments, he gained extensive experience in domestic and international fisheries management, maritime law enforcement, waterway management, search and rescue, and port state control. He's a graduate of the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and a Master of Marine Affairs from the University of Washington. Egypt. Uh, thanks, Sal. Um, thanks, Nikki, for the uh, invitation. I do have a uh, kind of a fond spot in the Navy when I was assigned to countries on the West Coast. Um, in the small towns in uh, Northern California and Oregon, they would uh, adopt our ships and our crew and take care of us when we come in the door. So I just wanted to say thanks to uh, Navy for that. Of course, not very much. remarks. Um, the offshore wind is new. I've actually, I'm pretty new to the company myself. I've been here for about nine months. Uh, and so I thought I would just, Sal asked me to set the stage of what um, offshore wind activities we're doing here in the U.S. So first of all, Equinor uh, is a broad-based energy company um, formed in Norway in 1972, so 50 years old. Um, it's been five decades in the oil and gas industry, uh, but the last 10 years they've been really focused on becoming uh, the global leader in renewable energy transition. Um, they've been president in offshore oil and gas in the United States since 1987, so down in Texas, a lot of work down there. Um, and they, Equinor has been uh, has built and operated four wind farms in the last 10 years in Europe, uh, in the United Kingdom and in Germany, uh, powering over 1 million homes. So they've now brought that, and there's more uh, development in the works from the UK, Norway, Germany, um, Korea, and then of course here in the US. So we're bringing that experience uh, here to the United States. Um, Equinor does have two leased areas that we've purchased here in uh, two major projects in the US. Uh, that will bring 4.4 gigawatts um, of power um, to the, the New York and New England region um, to support the Biden administration's goal of 30 uh, gigawatts of energy by 2030. So we're going to contribute 4.4 to that. Um, I want to number that everybody should keep in mind real quick is seven, number seven. There are only seven offshore wind turbines in the U.S. right now. Seven. So when I start getting the numbers here for magnitude, it's just like Equinor to kind of see what we're doing here. So the first project I want to talk about is Empire Wind. That's uh, about 15 to 30 miles uh, south of Long Island, 80,000 acres of, uh, of area. Um, we'll account for about 140 turbines as opposed to seven in the United States. So 140 turbines. Um, there will be two offshore um, substations out there that convert the energy from the wind, and then they will then follow export cables, two different export cables, one into Long Island, one into Brooklyn, to feed into the New York power grid. And that will provide about 2.2 gigawatts of, uh, of energy right there. Um, some timelines. Okay, we acquired that in 2017. We're in the permitting process right now. Um, onshore construction for those onshore sites and some other things will be um, started all the approvals go uh, appropriately in 2024. And then offshore installation is not until 2025. So again, some numbers. Not in 2017, eight years from now, we might be actually building turbines when it's still in the water. Um, and then the full power 
ideally in 26.27 for the Empire Wolf Trap. A couple of little facts and figures. Fun facts, these are about, about a thousand foot tall turbines as well. So some of those ones you see on the road, much bigger than those. Yeah. And uh, one rotation of one of those turbines is, uh, will power a New York home uh, for one and a half days. So it's just one hour for an hour and a half. Um, the other project, Beacon Hinge. That's about uh, 20 miles south of Nantucket or 60 miles east of Montauk. Almost the same numbers, about 140 turbines. Um, and it'll provide 2.4 um, gigawatts of power. Um, a little over 1.2 of that right now is already dedicated to New York. And we're in the process of uh, figuring out the other 1.2 will go. Um, we're in negotiations right now, somewhere in New England or New York. Um, And then to support these, I think two key ones you see in the news a lot. The Port of Albany right now, there's a big construction project going on up there. That'll be to build the various uh, wood turbine component parts. So the construction facility up there. Um, that'll come down and uh, down the river from Hudson, and then they'll land at the Southern Brooklyn Marine Terminal, where they'll also be joined up with other offshore wind parts and fabricated, and they'll go offshore to do the construction that we're talking about with the potential boats and that type of thing. Um, Southern Group from the Marine Terminal, they'll also have a longer use. So once these wind turbines are in use, we're thinking these are about a 30 year, that they'll be, off, they'll be running for 30 years. Um, you'll need an operation and maintenance facility, which is what Brooklyn will be. That's where we'll have boats running out of there. You can support operations, food transfers, um, and that type of thing. We'll also be a command center type of thing there, but where you can do the power of so can, uh, you know, monitoring the activity. Um, and just a general speaking area. And that's about it. So that kind of gives you the big picture of this. And so we're just one developer. There's many other developers out there. Um, but those are our two projects right now. And happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, finally, uh, Sam DeBerga, uh, Executive Vice President for Hornback Offshore Work Services. Uh, he oversees all legal and corporate matters for the company and serves on his executive management team. He writes and lectures frequently on the topic of the Jones Act, U.S. cabotage law applicable to the transportation of merchandise. Exactly. Good afternoon, and uh, very nice to see all of my fellow panelists here, uh, and, and all of you. Thank you to the uh, Navy League for putting this on. I think it's been a fantastic uh, conference so far. I really enjoyed the remarks this morning. I also want to salute young men and women that are here today from uh, SUNY uh, who took the initiative to come out and learn about these topics. And uh, you know, uh, well done, hats off, and, and uh, www. We're back off to you. You're hard. So, so um, uh, you know, I think that the common theme that, that we've heard here today is is pretty clear, right? Uh, there is a, a vulnerability we have. Soft assets, people, hard assets, ships, and everything in between. And, uh, and that's, that's, a, that's a problem, it's a failure, it's a true uh, vulnerability for this country and something that, that we all have to work on. Um, from our company's perspective, just to tell you a little bit about going back, uh, we have uh, 78 ships and we operate principally in the offshore energy sector as well as uh, military contracts, governments. Uh, Contracts for the Navy where we uh, interface with uh, some of these Ohio flying submarines. Um, um, so, um, you know, basically, um, what we're we're here to talk about wind, but what I would like to suggest to you is that you know all this old is new again. Uh, so, uh, the offshore wind field uh, is a, another iteration of the offshore. Oil. Uh, we, we invented uh, the offshore oil field in South Louisiana, Texas. Uh, there's companies like ours and our competitors that really figured out you know, how to do that kind of work, how to build the kinds of ships uh, that do that kind of work. Uh, we exported that technology around the world um, and it is now going to be redeployed in this uh, nascent uh, industry that is very exciting you know, for, for all of us. And I think that there's Lots of opportunities. That's that's the good news. The bad news is that 
companies like mine have had to fight. In fact, we're, we're in a lawsuit right now um, with the United States government. Um, you know, in order to ensure that the law, particularly the Jones Act, is applied in the way that uh, it's written. Um, and so it is very difficult uh, to get companies, to get our investors to sign up and excited about billions of dollars in new ships. Our last rebuild program was about billion billion. Uh, when there is significant uncertainty uh, that is created by, you know, uh, by the government. Uh, so that is a problem. We talked a lot about uh, mariners and, and you know, soft asset uh, uh, issue. I'll tell you, you know, we're hiring. We, we've hired about 300 mariners this year. Uh, so we're very excited about that. Um, and, and I think that that's going to that's gonna continue. The mariners are there. Uh, the interest in uh, it is what we have, where we failed is, is I think, um, creating um, a clear <coughs> career path uh, for, for mariners. Chris mentioned the, the, um, the damage that SDCW used on the Haas pipe. It's uh, very real uh, and has to be addressed. But I think that at the end of the day, uh, we, can, we can get there. Uh, Chris also mentioned the, uh, the WAFA, the American uh, Offshore Workers Fairness Act, which is, I think, a very critical uh, piece of legislation. Uh, I think, frankly, uh, that it is, you know, we, we are at a tipping point, and I think a WAFA is it uh, in terms of, you know, what are we going to do about these problems that we're talking about today? A WAPA passed the House, the Nancy Pelosi House, 378 to 40. Right? So that ought to tell us something. You know, that should that should say something. I think we'll get a little bit more into you know, what that statute is about. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we can build ships, we can own ships, we can finance ships, we need people. We need capital, we need clarity in the manner which our laws are enforced. Uh, and um, that's, you know, that's, that's kind of the bottom line. Totally agree with Chris. We can do anything. There's, there's no, no marine operation that we are incapable of. And, uh, when you look at the kinds of things that we do next to offshore production platforms, you know, 10,000 feet of water, uh, 105 five miles offshore uh, in any sea state, it's take the property back. So uh, you know we're you know we have no shortage of of, of the money in this country. So uh, thanks Sal. I guess we'll turn it over to you and see where we go. Yeah. All right. Uh, I want to thank our panelists for their opening <coughs> statements and everything. I love great opening statements. The only thing I hate about them is they take a lot of my questions away. Because uh, they were so extensive. So I actually have two and I'm gonna throw them to the to the group first and I'll direct them to number two and have them open to everybody. And then we'll go out into the audience and explore the questions. So, Everett, you talked about uh, national security as a theme we saw here. Uh, New England is unique in that it is an uh, kind of an uh, energy island, which is so dependent on the importation of energy. We've just seen a recent demonstration of energy disruption in the vault. Obviously, wind is not uh, natural gas. But we've just seen that happen. Uh, what would be some of the big concerns going forward as we? develop these uh, wind farms, get more dependent on uh, this energy that's available and, and as I just found out, to power our home with just one spin and everything like that. So I'm putting one of these up behind my house immediately. Uh, where do we go with this? Hey, thanks so much, Sal. Um, I think that uh, first and foremost, you know, I look at this as an opportunity to have more resiliency locally in, in the energy and the such. Of course, that all depends on on how the contracts get, get structured and, and how that infrastructure comes ashore. But then uh, what what uh, Cap Marone talked about as well is, you know, each one of these turbines feeds a substation, the substation then, uh, or the generation station then, um, you know, uh, pipes that uh, or cables that energy ashore. And so we need to make sure that from an uh, overall security standpoint that uh, 
we have the right uh, security measures in place for those uh, vulnerable nodes or for those uh, key nodes in the system uh, to make sure that they're, they're protected. And so I think that's work that we're, uh, you know, working with the other federal agencies and working with uh, the uh, owners uh, or the, the industry uh, to, to make sure that uh, we understand where those nodes are and what those uh, layers of protection are. Uh, but there's still more work to do. Just building on that just a little bit more, uh, the Coast Guard does 11 major missions. Overstressed is not a suitable word to talk about what the Coast Guard does on a daily mission. Uh, as you start seeing the development of these offshore vehicles, you know, what's some elements that can be used to advance vehicles? Good, you know, what can we be using here to keep uh, security on these issues? And I think your point about redundancy is really important when we all think about what happened in Texas and the Texas power grid going offline and the lack of redundancy in that area. Yeah, thanks. I think, uh, you know, when we look back at the security again, um, you know, what, what I mentioned in the opening remarks and, and what uh, exists today is first and foremost, you know, the industry responsibility. Uh, requirement to have a plan, requirement to have mitigation, requirement to uh, secure that facility. And there's a lot of work that, that gets done, whether it's on the port side facilities to, uh, you know, put up uh, fencing and screening and access control and all that stuff. And those same parallels exist uh, out uh, on uh, for the offshore uh, wind farms. Uh, you mentioned autonomy, and uh, you know there there may be uh, opportunities to um, use more, uh, or there certainly will be opportunities to use more uh, sensing systems out there uh, within the structures that are out there to get a better understanding of what the environment is like out there. Uh, one of the challenges that we also see is as we bring this new technology online, um, it too is spawning new technology. And so we're seeing the uh, request for use of autonomous vessels to do survey work. And so um, for, for folks that uh, might have uh, been following what's happening in the autonomous uh, industry right now, um, you know, you have these autonomous underwater um, uh, vehicles that look kind of like uh, uh, torpedoes that go out and uh, do survey work for scientific missions, for uh, industrial applications, all that kind of stuff. And so what we're seeing now is uh, increased desire to use uh, surface uh, sensor platforms about the same size, about uh, 14, 15 feet long, uh, but uh, just operate autonomously out there to do it. And so that's, you know, I think that uh, there's paths forward for that kind of work, but that how new technology is going to be integrated into uh, this emerging field is something that uh, you know we're, we're working very closely on and uh, very interesting. Okay. Anybody else in the panel want to chime in on that? Uh, EJ, uh, on this discussion, obviously we are slow in developing our offshore wind compared to other nations. And we're talking about, again, bringing in technology from other areas. Is there a concern that we have with proprietary uh, knowledge coming in or are we talking about having to develop our own technology for this way uh, of farms? I would say it's pretty open knowledge, quite honestly. Um, probably one difference, though, so, uh, I know it's very heavily involved in Scotland right now with a called floating wind, offshore wind. The ones I was just talking about were actually fixed, rolled into the sea bottom because the, the depth of water accommodates that. But some of the new east areas that you're seeing are going to be available off California, by the Gulf of Maine, and other places, or it will push further and further off to accommodate shipping or other uses of the water. Um, we call it floating wind, which essentially is it's anchored to the, to the floor. So it's still fixed, but it moves around a little bit, but it's just not fully drilled. Yeah, it's not dead, uh, it's not being seen um, So that's kind of a newer technology, I would say. Um, very few people do that right now. I can know one of them, so it makes it a little more competitive. But the rest of it, I think it's all um, pretty much there. Uh, I think the biggest, uh, quite honestly, the more difficult thing you sort of alluded to it, is it comes ashore and it has to feed the U.S. power grid, which is old and aging, and was actually built to bring power from inland to the coast, and now we're giving power from the coast and pushing it out the other way. So that's actually working with the Eversources, the NSTARs, the whatever the name them, on getting their grids. Uh, Sam, uh, you mentioned the Jones Act and uh, 
you are a contributor writing about the Jones Act, and if you'd like, out side, we have some of these. These are from the Journal of Maritime Law and Commerce, which I know you all subscribe to anyway. But in case you don't, one or two people in here know. Uh, this is an article that Sam wrote back in 2013, I believe. But the issue of the Jones Act obviously becomes a, a very touchy, touchy subject when we start talking about actual everything from not just the construction of the vessel, but to the attachments and material on board. Uh, do we need to look at that act when it comes to offshore wind to better refine it to represent the changing? You know, obviously, wind technology was not in the, in, in, on the horizon in 1920. So, what are we looking at today? Yeah, I don't think so. I, I, I think the statute is very clear. Yeah, the statute is, it is and, and uh, the beauty of the statute is also its brevity. Um, so, I don't think the, the, the problem is not with the statute. Uh, the problem is with the interpretation that's been given to the statute uh, and and the mechanism that we established uh, to allow for those interpretations. And if you'll allow me, I'll, I'll just elaborate a little bit. So um, while many people think that it's the Coast Guard is in charge of the, the Jones Act, it's really not. It's, it's customs. Um, and uh, customs, you have to remember, uh, is a, a uh, agency of the United States that's concerned with trade, and for you know most of its existence, you know some kind of free trade and Latin trade occurred. Well, interpretation of the Jones Act was deposited uh, with with customs, and what customs allows is for if someone wants to find out whether or not they're going to engage uh, in in an activity that is covered by the Jones Act, uh, they can ask customs for. An interpretation. Well, the only people that ask for that interpretation are people that are not planning to comply with the Jones Act. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the first problem, right? So, uh, so you have a, a letter that goes in uh, to customs, an agency that you know sort of wants to see trade happen, um, and um, and the letter is provided based upon uh, proponent sort of coloring, if you will, and, and advocacy of, of the situation. Um, and so surprise, surprise, uh, you get you know, hundreds of customs interpretations that, that are released that uh, sort of uh, make that particular transaction uh, authorized. That letter then uh, is, becomes, if you will, almost like a part of the customs common law. <laughs> And uh, customs cannot revoke that letter without a notice and comment process. It's insane. Okay, so uh, it didn't have to go through a notice and comment process or any kind of advocacy from the other side uh, in order to issue the letter. But yet, to take the letter off the books, it has to go through a notice and comment process. So, in our industry, what happened? Uh, so, in our industry, in the offshore oil industry. Uh, as we began pushing further out into deeper water, uh, the, this, the, this, the, the, the offshore oil field changed. And we always sort of think about the offshore oil field as all that stuff that's on the surface of the sea that we can see. But actually, the vast majority of the offshore oil, oil field is on, the, is on the sea floor. And all that stuff, which is being deployed there in waters of 6,000, 8,000, 10,000 feet of water depth, has to be placed there by a ship with a crane. Um, and there's then all the pipelines and everything sort of tied all together. Um, through a, a number of, of interpretations that were issued by customs, customs basically determined that the transportation of a um, any kind of device that you put on the sea floor picked up at Port Bouchon or Mobile or wherever it is and transported out to that place on the outer continental shelf and sat down by that ship with its crane. That was not transportation merchandise between two points in the United States, but it clearly is. It clearly is. Uh, those letters have remained on the books. Uh, and we've gone through uh, three notice and comment processes to try to have them pulled back. We've had to sue customs, we're in litigation with customs. Um, another uh, problematic area deals with pipeline. So if I bring in, if I want to lay a 
pipeline or umbilical or something sort of connecting all that equipment offshore, or even export pipeline to Glen Helen. And I come in with my pipeline vessel. Today, pipe is spooled. So it's spooled under this giant spool, right? Spool base in Mobile, Alabama. And it takes that pipeline and it lays it down on the seafloor on the outer continental shelf. Custom says that's not transportation, which has to be in the United States. And it clearly is. Those molecules moved from Mobile to the seafloor. They didn't. Customs, the way that what, what Customs has said is because the pipeline is paid out, but not unladen, a shipping, a shipping and trade term, then it's not transportation. Well, that's, it's, that's nonsense. All of that has resulted in companies like mine not being able to invest in the ships that do that kind of work, right? Uh, because the foreign, com the foreign ships that we're competing with um, are you know, being built in Norway, nation, you know, both countries, but in addition, and probably more problematic, uh, um, they don't pay taxes, that was alluded to in the day, and then they also um, are crewed, um, even though the ownership of that ship might be Norwegian or English or usually first world, usually they are crewed by not first world. Although they're working in this country, so uh, so we, it's just cre created a situation that is uh, untenable for you know the U.S. company to be able to, to compete. So those are the kinds of things that we're trying to deal with and, and and overcome. That we all want this to be an American industry. That's the promise of Quinn. You know, um, and uh, the problem is, at least on the maritime side. You know, unless we get some of these things cleared up, we are going to be boxed out of, of doing it on our own, our continental shelf. And I think that's a that's a lost opportunity and a disaster for us. And it's also, um, I think, an example of how it is that our national maritime infrastructure has weakened. You know, we, we've allowed that to happen, and we have to, we have to take that back. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Chris, you mentioned the American Offshore Workers' Parents. And obviously, uh, this is an act that you said had bipartisan support. It's not usually say at all. But it met support very similar to what we saw with the Christian Reform Act earlier this year, where we saw bipartisan support. Uh, what's the implications of this act? Should it be passed or should it not be passed? And then the role of Merchant Mariners, we have a panel later on where we talk about concerns about merchant mariner numbers. Is this an opportunity for our mariners to find a form that could be used in time of war to help serve sea for example? So I'll take the second part of the question first. So when you're looking at uh, mariners needed for sea lift, um, there's a very specific mariner you're looking for. Most of you know it's an unlimited ocean license that, that you're looking for. Um, Within the, I do a lot of work with the NMC. I forget how many different kinds of licenses there are, but and the combinations are incredible. But I believe it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 120. Um, so we're really talking about only eight of those possibilities of the 120. Um, yes, obviously, um, AMO. Uh, we do a lot of DP work as well as Hornbeck, not quite as much as they do. But our DP vessels are very large ships. Um, <clears throat> as far as even you know, one of those uh, Panamax prior to the to the enlarging of the canal. Um, excuse me. Along those lines, yes, it's a it's a large opportunity. Should it be passed? Should it not be passed? Lou Sands alluded to it. It's a it's a very large lost opportunity um, from the standpoint of employment of more mariners that could be used to fill the seal of hole um, for times of national emergency. And it's also um, an issue that will likely, uh, from a political standpoint, there'll be people coming in saying, well, we're, we're going to come in and we're just going to, we need a couple of waivers here and we'll show you how to do it. And then after some time, we'll leave and you can have it. Which it's never gonna. It's never gonna work that way, and that's 
that's what we're all going for. Thank you, Chris. I uh, want to open it up to the audience while we have opportunity for questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, Sam, you said you guys were able to hire 300 people this year. That's great. You're set up a little better for the transition from the oil field to the wind because one of the things is the locations. We're getting a lot of interest from our members, especially the younger ones, my son included, that don't want to do 120 days. They don't want to do 90 days. They want to do four weeks on, four weeks on. So, uh, I'm worried about how we're going to plan our other ships when this checks up. You guys, uh, you anticipate any problems with that with this company you have existing business, completing that workforce to build the wind farm stuff? Yeah, well, uh, look, it, it's a constant it's, it's a constant battle, right? And rotations are a big part of it. So uh, we generally are, you know, even time 28, 28. Um, and uh, that's the good news, it's great for mariners, right? Uh, it's, 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 it's harder for the company because it, it intensifies the number of grounders we, we need to have, you know, on the bench. Uh, and um, so, I, you know, I think it's just a constant uh, readjustment and, and, and thinking through, you know, the airlines do this so well, and our industry really has not figured out how to do it. I have a good friend of mine who's a pilot uh, for one of the big airlines. And as you move up in seniority, you basically bid for the Routes you want to bid for the ships you want to, <laughs> and you and you sort of you know buy buy the work life that you want to have, and um, you know I'm not suggesting that would necessarily work here, but, but it just seems to me that, that we lock ourselves into some paradigms that that are um, maybe uh, spike make, making it a lot more for ourselves. Uh, I think that um, what we're seeing is in, in workforce, the younger workforce in particular, is they're looking. One of the things that's so great about our industry. And uh, so uh, we've got a lot to sell, and I think we have to do a better job of selling and recruiting uh, in, in this, into this industry and, and making the industry appear to be something that is sustainable for a career. And I, I'm not going to come to this, and, and it's going to go away. Um, and um, so, uh, which is more of a challenge for us in the oil field. Our, our business is very sick. Our ships tend to be at the larger end of the spectrum, and so we have a little bit more stability in terms of utilization over time. It's, it's very, very, very tough. But what, if, if you don't mind, so I, I'd like to, to just put a little finer point on this uh, this offshore workers act because I think it's it's I want everybody to, to sort of appreciate and walk away from here with how crazy this is, this situation is. Um, so I want I want to imagine first of all. I'll disclose you. I want all ships working on the US OCS to be gems that qualify. That's right. Okay. But anyway, let's pretend for a moment there's a, an application, this pipeline application I mentioned to you earlier, that custom says is is not covered by the gems Act. And we decide that we're gonna go into that pipeline business. And so we're gonna do what everybody in the international market does. We're gonna go to a yard in Korea or a yard in Vietnam, we build a pipeline vessel. Uh, and we find a yard over there, and there's two pipeline vessels. Right. And uh, we, going back offshore, we buy one. We're Americans. And uh, a Norwegian company buys the other. We both want to bring that pipeline vessel right up here to New York and work this wind oil with this wind field laying uh, all of these um, cables that you can lay. Five ships for the same price. We both flag our ships to Vanuatu. We bring our ships to the United States to begin work and bid, begin bidding for Ecuador. Ecuador puts out a bid. On my ship, even though it's foreign flagged, it's foreign built. Because I am a US citizen, I must have a US crew on the ship. I must have on the marine crew and what we refer to as the backpack crew. Everybody, my ship has to be 100% US citizens. I have to pay US taxes. I have to deal with all of the accoutrements of American regulation. My Norwegian friend, same ship, same flags, 
can flag, can crew that vessel with Malaysians, Filipinos, whatever country he wants, pay them their wages, pay zero taxes, sort of be exempt from regulation, not entirely, but sort of. And so when I turn in my bid, my bid is 30% higher than his. Because 80% of the operating cost of a ship is the crew. That's what's going on. That is madness. <laughs> that is madness. Right? We, we, can, we can't have that. That has to be fixed. Um, and, uh, you know, that is not what Oxla intended in the manning provisions of Oxla. It has, it, it just broke. And now there are vested interests, and that mostly they are vested in the oil field, from where I hail. Um, and they want no part of it. But they're also trying to, you know, essentially infiltrate that same scheme, it's a subsidy, into the wind industry. And I think we have to say, no more. That, that's, that cannot be. That, that, there's, if someone can raise their hand and explain to me how that is somehow fair or rational, you know, you can, maybe you can convince me, but it's, it's not. That makes no sense. And that's what this statute is about. That's what, that's what it's trying to fix. So I think that uh, there's uh, vessels that are uh, built to uh, Subchapter L um, that are uh, relocating and doing some of the work up here uh, for uh, doing survey work, doing uh, um, uh, service work, doing support work uh, that's out here. There's a whole range of vessels that are working uh, up in this area. But yeah, there are some vessels coming up. Uh, so. So I think that uh, in the early stages right now that reflect the type of work that's going on, um, it, it's not large. But as this industry goes out, we heard from Cap Marone about the extent of development that's happening offshore. Uh, then we expect uh, you know, a growth in the number of vessels that are operating in this area. There's going to be some dedicated vessels built, purpose built for the surface, uh, but there's also going to be repurposing of other vessels. Yeah, just some quick numbers without getting into the zones after going to the U.S. boats and all that type of stuff. But the, uh, the installation, for example, for Empire Wind, you're going to use a, uh, a wind turbine installation vessel. It's about one, it's a big, big vessel. Probably going to be supported by three heavy transport um, boats that are bringing out the turbine component parts of what they're installed in. There's going to be a rock installation boat doing those. One that's putting all the rock and the foundation, and then one that does an armor layer over all the things, as well as an inter, -array, inter -array cable main boat, and then an export cable boat. So I already lost the thing on my toes here, but that's about 10 boats, I mean, just for one installation. Right, are, they, are, they coming, are they coming up to the oil fields? It depends on who's bidding on, on what. I mean, for example, one of the uh, Great Lakes Dolphin Bridge is building one of the yep. rock main boats. That's what we do in the armor layer because of the CDB interpretation of one But the other ones, there's different locations, but I can't seem to speak for all the developers on that. I could maybe take a shot. Uh, the, answer to, the answer is yes and no. Right? Certainly, the um, uh, setting aside the, the cable layers and the uh, installation vessels, et cetera, um, I think you know, all of the vessels that, that we have are completely, completely capable doing this kind of work um, and uh, and I think that they probably ought to come up from, from the oil field. I think that that is what makes mo most economic sense for both ourselves as, as the vessel operators and for the economic and the, the, the developers. Now, something that we're seeing is that the developers are, are asking for new builds um, and, uh, and they are specking out these new builds uh, you know, I think they're, they're going to be beautiful, but they're going to be really expensive. You know, really, really expensive. You know, hundred million dollars a ship. Um, and you know, when 
which you know makes us scratch our heads. Look, we, we've got to ship it. Basically, do that work with the training crews and do it, and 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 off you go. I mean, you don't have to spend that kind of money. So, um, uh, but there's no question in our minds that you know the assets that we have in the Gulf of Mexico are 100 percent worth. We are out of time because we need to get over to our next panel. If you would join me in thanking our panel. Thank you, everybody.